Um, next we have Professor David Harvey. Uh, 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 David Harvey is the Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, he has authored many books and essays that have been prominent in the development of modern geography as a discipline. Uh, he is a proponent of the idea of the right to the city. And he's here to speak to us today about uh, the question of the nation state, God on earth, or maybe some other things. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it's a great privilege to be here. I basically came here to learn, uh, but uh, in order to do that, uh, I was told I had to speak. So <laughs> I have to think of something to say. Uh, the topic I was assigned is not my favorite topic uh, and so I thought I'd really talk to the question of dissecting capitalist modernity. Uh, at this point uh, I also find from the last speaker that I'm sometimes described as a Marxist so by definition I'm the enemy. So I had better watch out. Um, Murray Bookchin, by the way, who has, I think, been very influential uh, with Ajalan, uh, in his last essay suggested that the future of the left would depend upon the best of Marxism and the best of anarchism being brought together in a common project, which I suppose it means that David Graeber and I are going to have to write a joint book. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first part of the book will be called Listen Marxist, and the second part will be called Listen Anarchist. <laughs> um, I've just actually uh, written a book, uh, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. Uh, two days ago I saw the German translation, so the German translation is now available. Uh, the Turkish translation uh, is due out and I will give a presentation on it in Istanbul in May. But there were really two questions uh, which were central to the book, which I think are relevant to what we're talking about here. The first question is, what does it mean to be anti-capitalist? I think that's rather badly understood. And so what I was trying to do was to define what is the nature of capital, and if we oppose it, what lines of opposition have to be constructed? And now, there are many uh, forms of oppression, of course, and capital is not the only form of oppression. Forms of gender oppression, racial oppression, and so on exist. And I think uh, all of those forms of oppression have to be resisted. But to me it was important to try to say, well, if we're going to resist capital, what is it we have to do? And the second question in the book was, why should we be anti-capitalist? Actually, a lot of people are very happy with capitalism. Many of us, even though we're critical of capitalism, happily walk around with our cell phones, which are capitalist inventions, and capitalist produced. Uh, we use social media, which are capitalistly organized. And so questions are also being posed within the capitalist world itself over the issue of is an ethical capitalism possible? So there is a movement which you might call conscience capitalism. And 
and we see elements of that around us. The most interesting in the last few weeks has been these two laws on religious freedom passed in Oklahoma and in Indiana which would allow people to discriminate against gays and lesbians in particular on religious grounds. What did capitalist corporations do? They basically told the Indiana and Oklahoma legislatures back off, cut it out, we want to defend the rights of gays, lesbians, against this form of religious persecution. So the two legislatures have quickly changed their law. There are many people in the capitalist class who think that social inequality has gone too far and that redistributive activity is crucial. There are many people within the capitalist class who really seriously believe the environmental issue needs to be addressed and that therefore they are prepared to put themselves in the forefront of a struggle over global warming and other forms of environmental degradation. So one of the issues I think is to say well we can be anti-neoliberal but pro-capitalist. We can be anti-monopoly capitalism and pro-capitalist. Is that an option? And it seemed important to me to show that it is not an option. Because capital often makes promises. I think there's no question that on some of those promises it's half delivered. In the field of human rights, for example, which is founded on private property ideals, it has gone some considerable way in certain areas. So what we have to do is to show that there is a good reason that we cannot solve, say, the Kurdish question within the dynamics of capital accumulation. If it would be possible to solve questions of global warming, questions of social inequality, questions of uneven geographical development, questions of ethnic racial oppression, and still keep capitalism intact, then, frankly, I would be in favor of doing that. I would not be anti-capitalist, but I am anti-capitalist for certain reasons. And the reasons were not because there were some accidents in my genetic makeup, or there were some peculiarities in my upbringing, or that there was something that happened to me that turned me from a rather privileged person into a victim. I cannot claim any of those things. I am anti-capitalist for purely rational reasons. And actually, I think this is terribly important. That rational people are capable of listening to rational reasons. And so one of the issues that I was concerned with was to give rational reasons why we should be anti-capitalist. Now the contradictions I was looking at are those issues which would need to be addressed if we were anti-capitalist. And they are a complex set of reasons and these reasons actually lock together One aspect of this would be to say, if you're anti-capitalist, then you should privilege the idea of use value over the exchange of exchange value. This is something that uh, actually you can find in Ojalan too, that this is part of what we should be concerned with. That we should actually be able to resist the power of money. Now the money question is a huge question. 
this was a question which faces the idea that we can create autonomous spaces within the world where something different can go on. And this, of course, is foundational to the interesting and, in many respects, inspiring ways in which some of the ideas about autonomous spaces are being developed in Kobani and the like. But to have an autonomous space and use global money and to be subject to, therefore, the rule of the dollar or any other currency, you're not autonomous. This came up in the Scottish referendum, which I think is, to me, was a very interesting feature. I don't like Scottish nationalism. I don't like nationalism of any sort. So when the Scottish nationalists said, we want to do things and become autonomous, I didn't support it. But it soon became clear that the Scottish cause was twofold. There were the Scottish nationalists. And then there were people who were saying, we want to create an autonomous space to liberate ourselves from the austerity politics of London and develop an entirely different social model to that which is being superimposed upon us by neoliberal governmentality of, in London. When it switched into the idea of an autonomous space which would develop an alternative social model, I started to support the Scottish referendum and say, yeah, let England be England and you go off and create your autonomous space. But then there was an interesting question. Who would control the currency? And the Scottish people said, well, we'd still use the Bank of England. And you remember, one of the worst mistakes that was that of the Paris Commune in 1871 was that they protected the Bank of France. They protect, protected the major instrument of their own domination. And here are the Scots saying, we want our autonomous space in which we can do as we want and create an alternative model of social and economic development. But then, okay, we actually accept the domination of the Bank of England. Now, of course, Marx and Engels hoped one day that the world would live under the dictatorship of the proletariat. But actually, we live under the dictatorship of the world's central bankers. And they are the worst of the worst. And, of course, they're surrounded with the International Monetary Fund and the, you know, the Treasury Departments of major powers. But what are you going to do in your autonomous space about the fact that money power is there and money power as Marx pointed out sorry he did say some nice things <laughs> money power destroys the community and becomes the community so that the democracy we have in the world now is the democracy of money power that is what United States democracy is about, and you see it very clearly. It is the democracy of money power, and it's protected by a Supreme Court that says the expenditure of money is a protection of free speech. In other words, there is democracy in the United States, but it is a certain kind of democracy. It is certainly not the confederal democracy that Ojalan is talking about. And certainly, the development of these autonomous spaces in which assembly structures of democracy can be constructed is something alternative. But one of the big contradictions is the relationship between value and money as its representation. 
And actually, value is a social relation. It is not objective. It is immaterial. And it has its material representation in the money form. But the money form is no longer material. It has become notional, fictional. And actually the money form is now harnessed to deal with what is the major contradiction, which is most dangerous right now, which is the commitment that capital has to perpetual compound growth. Compound growth forever. And as you will know, compound growth is something that begins very slowly and then doubles and doubles and doubles and it becomes huge within a while. And part of the argument I make in the book is that we are at an inflection point where the compounding is becoming so fierce, so strong, that there's almost no way any society can absorb it, except in one way only. It has to find some way to grow in an environment where there is no limit to growth. What is it that can grow without constraint? Money. So what are the central banks doing? They're adding zeros to the world's money supply. That is, infinite growth of the money form is possible. We used to think millionaires were rich. We don't anymore. We think billionaires are rich, and now we're talking about trillionaires being the real rich. That's all about compounding growth. And where can that compounding growth be in, go and be invested in? There's not room to do it in production, so it goes into assets. The art market. It goes into property. It goes into land. Land prices all around the world are shooting upwards. Property prices everywhere are shooting upwards to the point where nobody can afford to live at the zenith of this horrible system called New York City. Nobody can afford to live in the center of London. Nobody can afford to live actually in the center of almost any major city anymore because everybody is actually investing in property. And actually, construction and building is now not about building houses for people, it's about building condominiums for investment, in which nobody lives. That's one of the wonderful sights of New York, walking around at night and seeing how many lights are on in the ultra-rich condominiums of New York City about five out of 400. Nobody lives there. It's simply an investment. This is a crazy situation where exchange value destroys the delivery of use values to the mass of the population. And if we go back to use value and exchange value in the housing market, you see immediately what the nature of the difficulties are. So, my time is up, but I want to put that idea and say, until we find a way to address the whole dynamics of what capital is about, how we should be anti-capitalist and why we should be anti-capitalist, it remains obscure. We will work on being anti-other things. For example, you gave a wonderful talk and I agree with it entirely, except there's nothing anti-capitalist about it. <laughs> nothing. You could resolve all those questions without changing the capitalist dynamic. And I think, oh yes, oh yes you could. And I think that we need, we need to be very sure, and I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm not in favor of solving all those questions, because I am. I'm very supportive of that and supportive of other things too. But what does it mean to be anti-capitalist is also a very important and significant question. And until we clearly understand what that means,
then the reason for being anti-capitalist is not there. And that is, if you like, the central question that I would like to throw into the pot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Harvey. Um,